Chapter 2. Detective Roy Arrives One of the weekly excitements of Longview Village was the arrival of the steamer from Glasgow bringing mail, merchandise, and occasionally visitors. There was no place for the ship to dock, so it was anchored some distance offshore where passengers and freights were transferred to a small boat and rowed ashore. It was almost like the arrival of a ship at one of the South Sea Islands, for most of the inhabitants would run out of their cottages to see the boat come in. A steamer had just dropped anchor in the bay. Through the early morning mist, the people on shore watched every movement on the vessel, while a fisherman with a telescope reported details. Males are off now, he said. Dog coming over. Suppose that's for Peter MacDonald. Don't seem to be any passengers. Oh, yes, there's a boy climbing down and a man just getting ready to follow. Don't seem to know them. Perhaps they're the folks that are coming to stay at the store. That's all. Now she's off again. They don't wait long, do they? As he finished, the steamer began to glide away to the north, and the tiny rowboat started on its return journey. The two passengers proved to be complete strangers to the village. The man was Mr. was a Mr. Wallace of Liverpool, who had been asked by his brother, general storekeeper of Longview, to spend his summer vacation in this quaint old place. Delighted with the offer, he had now arrived with his 14-year-old son, Roy, who, needless to say, was about as happy as any boy would be with such a holiday before him. It was not long, to be sure, before the newcomers were told of the recent mysterious happenings in the village. Mr. Wallace did not seem particularly interested, but Roy, he pricked up his ears to catch every detail and felt himself swelling into a real detective all at once. Here was adventure waiting for him. Could any vacation ever have started out more fortunately? At first, he could see no connection between the cave, the boat, the horse, and the herring. Yet, as he turned the matter over in his mind, he thought that at least there might be some slender thread joining the four mysteries. But what was it? What could it be? He was determined to find out. The village being a small one, he soon became well acquainted with everybody in it. Cautiously, he drew from one and all everything they could tell about the remarkable events of the past few days. Some of the kind-hearted villagers sent him up to the gamekeeper's house to find Oscar and Bruce, lads about your own age, as they said. Not finding them at home, he returned to the store. That afternoon, he walked along the shore to take a look at the celebrated cave. The tide was low, so he was able to get quite near. But there was nothing to see except the black opening. Somehow he didn't feel like climbing the steps. Not just then, not till he had found out more about it. There was, of course, just the possibility that someone might be inside. That same night, or rather the next morning, Longview inhabitants, Roy included, had another puzzling thrill. About a month before, one of the fishermen, after much hard saving, had purchased one of the most up-to-date and expensive cork life jackets to wear his new treasure and listen to the admiring comments of his associates was his pride and joy. Then came a sad happening. One fine evening when he was when he went home from his boat, he forgot that he had left 
the jacket lying on the deck of his vessel. That very night, a gale arose and the sea dashed over all the boats lying on the shore, washing away everything that was not securely fastened, including the much-prized jacket. The man was inconsolable for a day or two and continued for some time to grieve over his loss. Picture then his amazement and joy when on opening his front door one morning, he saw the long-lost cork life jacket right in front of him, securely suspended from a nail. How had it got into such a place? It must have been put there sometime after 11 p.m., for he had not gone to bed till then, and before 5.30 a.m., when he opened the door. However, despite the most careful inquiries, not a clue could be found as to who had put it there. Roy, with the villagers, was completely puzzled. Who had done it? And was there any connection between all the recent ghostly happenings? Was the cork life jacket related to the noises in the cave? In desperation, he determined to forget the whole affair for that afternoon and go for a good, long swim. Starting off briskly, he soon covered a considerable distance. As he began to feel tired, he crawled onto a small rock that was jutting out of the water and rested a while. Diving in again, he proceeded to another rock and thence, after a brief rest, to another. Thus he went on, gradually getting farther and farther away from the village. At last he felt he should go no farther, and decided that after one final rest he would return. Sitting on this last rock, he chanced to look shoreward. To his surprise, he found he was almost opposite the entrance to the cave. The opening looked small, for he was several hundred yards away from it, but it was quite distinct. And what was that? Surely his eyes did not deceive him. Something was moving in front of the cave. He looked again. Yes, it was a figure. But who was it? He could not distinguish. Unfortunately, in his excitement, Roy had forgotten his own perilous location. As he rose to his feet to get a better view, he lost his footing on the slippery rock and fell with a great splash into the water. When he came to the surface and could again look toward the cavern, the figure had disappeared.